Today we're going to start with the beginning of hydrological processes in ecosystems, HYD 141, and in doing so we're literally going to start pretty much in the beginning. And the beginning is the occurrence about 438 million years ago when terrestrial plant life began to populate the surface of the earth. Now just think for a minute what the surface of the earth would have been like without any vegetation present. The photo on the left can help motivate your thinking on that. Um, what would have happened is uh, what we often see today in an area is called badlands. And what happens there is that we see accelerated rates of soil erosion and soil production even. And that leads to gullying, rill formation, mass wasting, just a rapid acceleration in processes taking place on the surface of the earth. So in the absence of vegetation, um, you would really have had a very dynamic earth surface where the water cycle would be interacting with earthen materials and creating dramatic landscape change on a regular basis. The primary function of vegetation is to hold the earth surface together through the cohesive forces of roots, but also to protect the roots, or to protect the earth surface from rain splash and direct radiation. Um, and a variety of other processes that we're going to look at through the quarter. But just to motivate your thinking about hydrological processes in ecosystems, it helps to start at the beginning and recognize that vegetation wasn't always present and that its onset fundamentally changed the nature of processes on the surface of the earth. Meanwhile, throughout human civilization, we have caused changes to the occurrence, distribution, abundance, of vegetation on the Earth's surface. And so with the rise and fall of civilizations and different technologies, we've seen um, recurrences of deforestation and what we call afforestation, which is a return of forests. And that has led to a variety of processes as well. Um, the photo on the right shows an illustration of what can happen when you have steep terrain and there's logging that takes place, which then can enable mudslides to occur, which can um, be a disturbance that affects communities, just like I showed in the introductory le lecture with the case of Hurricane Mitch. So overall, what we're trying to do in this course is understand the interaction between water and plants and the Earth's surface to see what those mechanisms are that are present. To begin at the beginning, we're also going to start by considering the hydrology associated with an individual tree. We're not going to go much into the level of what's happening inside of a tree. We will look a little bit of that in terms of evapotranspiration. But first, let's just consider what we do as hydrologists at the level of an individual tree. And what we do is a water balance. So in terms of a water balance, we can have a control volume that would consist of the domain shown here by these purple um, arrows. So if we set aside that region, the water that enters that region consists of precipitation. And we use the term gross precipitation to reflect that that is the total water that's coming out of the sky and um, entering into our control volume associated with an individual tree. Then we have the water that gets held up in the tree, either on the canopy, it could be in the stem, um, branches, leaves, wherever. It's just on the tree and somewhere just not down in the roots, that's the only thing. Anything above the ground surface. That's the intercepted water. Then we have the throughfall. The throughfall consists of two elements, what we call free throughfall, which is the water that falls through the canopy without ever touching any piece of the vegetation and just goes straight through and hits the ground. And then we have the other part of throughfall, which is water that is intercepted by the tree, but then drops off um, out of the canopy. Separate from the throughfall, finally, is the stem flow. This is the water that accumulates from leaf to small branch to large branch down to the, the tree trunk and then runs down the trunk and goes to the ground. So we have this basic um, water balance. What's going in, precipitation, equals what's going out plus what's stored. And intercepted is essentially the stored water through fall and stem flow or what goes out. So you can see the basic accounting that I talked about in the introductory letter. And we have some simple 
uh, symbology here of gross precipitation, interception through fall and stem flow. Now let's put this into another perspective. Some of you may be familiar with the popular TV show Mythbusters. Mythbusters tested a myth related to this topic, which was the golf myth. According to this myth, golfers, some golfers believe that a tree is composed of 90% air. And so instead of trying to hit around trees, a golfer would be better off trying to just hit through the tree. And that um, the conjecture here is that if the tree is made up of 90% air and golf balls are relatively small, then there should be a 90% chance uh, of the ball being hit through the tree and not not um, being intercepted by the tree and, and being deflected. So to test this myth, Mythbusters, Mythbusters used uh, an avid golfer, they used one of their own um, people, and then they had a robotic machine. And they launched balls at the tree, and they found with the robot machine, about 24 out of 100 shots went through. For the avid golfer, he only took 10 shots, so 6 out of 10. And for the staff person, I think they had, you know, 27 shots out of 100 went through. So overall, all of these tests um, go towards refuting the myth that there's just no way that 90% of the canopy of a tree consists of sufficiently large air spaces to allow, um, you know, a golf ball to go through. Raindrops are smaller than golf balls, but even still... Um, it does make you wonder, you know, perhaps somewhere in this range, uh, more than 20% or so, or, or less, certainly less than 90%, um, might be, you know, passable airspace. So it's the same idea. It's essentially doing hydrology, but doing it sideways instead of vertically. The basic question that we have in understanding the hydrology of an individual tree is determining what fraction of water that falls out of the sky as gross precipitation goes through the tree as through fall or stem flow and then how much water gets intercepted. So this is a good time to just pause for a minute and think about in your own mind what do you think is the percent of water that gets intercepted by the tree? So think about that. Now to answer this question in general we need to make measurements. We could measure the gross precipitation with some kind of rain gauge. Um, we could also put buckets under a tree and measure the through fall of what's dripping out of the tree or passing straight through it. And we could accumulate water from some method to account for how much water goes a stem flow. The hardest thing to do is to deal with the interception. And notice here that the interception is shown with an arrow going up. The reason for that is it's often just assumed that water that's intercepted by a tree um, evapotranspirates away. And so that's why it shows up. Similarly, interception on the ground might also be um, going up as well. <clears throat> okay, so those are the basic ideas of, in general, how we can measure it. And what I'm going to do is we're going to go through case studies in the second part of this presentation in the separate video podcast. Right now I want to stay with the broad theories and concepts about how interception works um, and then we can motivate those with those case studies. In terms of measurement, the primary tool that gets used when um, precipitation is in the form of water as opposed to snow is a tipping bucket rain gauge. So in a tipping bucket rain gauge, as you can see in this movie, water that's falling down on the, on the tree um, it uh, goes into a funnel and the funnel takes it to this this bucket. When the bucket is full it tips because it goes out of balance and then the water splashes away. In the meantime every time there's a tip you can see that there's a uh, completion of a circuit here sometimes with uh, a magnet sometimes with um, electrical system and then that um, triggering then gets recorded as an event. And so you have the time and you have the occurrence of an event. And so therefore, you can see um, how many times a tip occurs over an interval of time. Each bucket is calibrated to a certain size. So if you know how much water a bucket can hold, then you can easily compute the total amount of water um, that is, is happening for each interval. And so a tipping bucket rain gauge measures the intensity of rainfall through time. 
The other key instrument that we're going to need is a stem. What this is is a way of um, capturing all of the water running down the stem, which tends to not be a lot, but to accumulate that, we use foam and we foam in around the tree. You can see it's a pretty thick amount of foam that fills in all the crevices in the bark and provides a nice collar. And then we just lay into that um, some form of plastic sheeting or hardened plastic. Um, and then we run pipes um, that then, you, know, you can see how this collar is, tip, is angled so that gravity takes the water, accumulates it down here on the left, and then it goes into a hole through the foam and into this pipe where it usually would go to some either storage tank or tipping bucket gauge or something like that. And I'll show more about that when we look at the examples. So let's turn to the concepts of what should affect the ability of canopies to affect interception versus throughfall. Of course, the type of vegetation, which means you know if you have a big tree or uh, uh, just litter on the ground, there's a fundamental difference in capacity in terms of the surface area of that um, vegetation or um, the ability of that vegetation to actually absorb water into itself. Another uh, example would be deciduous versus evergreen trees. So deciduous trees lose their leaves during the winter. As a result of that, they can't hold very much water in the winter. Conversely, they can hold a lot of water in the summer, more so than an evergreen. And an evergreen is going to hold about the same amount year-round. Canopy density, um, the more three-dimensional surface area there is to vegetation, then the more water it's going to be able to hold. Tree spacing, if trees are spaced farther apart, then there's going to be more throughfall. The canopy won't be interlocking. And for example, that's a big difference between Mediterranean climates and tropical climates. Okay, so branching configuration is the next factor to consider. Um, if a tree canopy is uh, has has its you know branches going up like this conically up then it's going to be funneling water in whereas if it's coming down like this then it's going to be shedding water away bark roughness and density we'll see that again in a difference between tropics and mediterranean or temperate climates um, very thick bark with lots of pores might have a lot more three-dimensional surface area to hold water Position of tree crown and the canopy in terms of the vertical structure and um, the number of layers having, you know, being able to capture more with more layers. And then land use history indicating what we call cumulative effects that through time, um, types of forest change and the layering of the canopy or the presence of understory um, or litter might be responding to the occurrence of wildfires or the way lands have been cleared in the past. Let me illustrate some of these key factors, um, and this is something that you should also do on your own. Is to, um, if you go out to different trees and you look up in the forest, you'll find that some places there are big holes. So this is the tree spacing and looking at the structure of the canopy. So in a conifer forest, it's a lot less interlocking. Whereas if you look at a broadleaf canopy, such as shown here, then you can see that um, there, it's a lot more interlocking, although there are still some gaps that are present. Here's a multiple um, canopy layers. It's a photo I took uh, in the Pacific Northwest, and you can see a rich understory that can also act as a secondary layer capturing stuff that makes it through the conifer layer. The forest plants uh, on the floor, as well as the litter that's on the floor, can also hold a significant amount of moisture. So that raises the question of how are we going to quantify metrics for individual trees or canopies that are interlocking trees to relate to the hydrological variables. Ecologists have come up with this metric called the leaf area index. This is the one-sided green leaf area per unit of ground area in broadleaf canopies or the projected needle leaf area per unit ground area in needle canopies. So what does that mean? Okay, well if you have a leaf, let's say my hand is a leaf, if I hold it like this then you could measure the area of that very easily, right? This is the area of my hand. If I hold it like this, um, we can the area of that surface is the same, but if you're water moving in this, this horizontal direction, you're, you don't care about that because you're only seeing um, the thickness that you see right here. 
And um, that's called the projected area. So the projected area in the plane that, that, that's perpendicular to the plane that the rain is falling into. And so we can estimate that leaf area um, on that basis. And one of the ways that gets done is using satellites. There are a couple of satellites right now that are what are called MODIS satellites, which is, means that they have an instrument called MODIS, I should say. And this MODIS instrument measures many different wavelengths of light. Remember, light is part of an electromagnetic spectrum. And it measures individual bands of electromagnetic radiation along that spectrum. And using that, it can compute a leaf area index. So this shows three maps of Africa for different seasons and the leaf area index values. And you can see these values range from zero, where there's no vegetation present, to, in this case, a maximum of about six. In terms of ground-based measurements, there's something called the leaf area index area meter. Or, in this case, one specific example, the LAI 2000 plant canopy analyzer. The way that this works is that you hold it above the canopy where there's no interruption of light and it measures the radiation that it detects within 148 field of view. So relative to a horizontal plane, you have a 180, 180 degree hemisphere or a half a hemisphere. And um, as a result of that, this is getting you know most of that view, but not all of it. So measurements are made first above the canopy, and then you go below the canopy and do the same thing. And there's going to be that light attenuation as a result of the interference of the canopy blocking the light, the same way that it could be blocking water. By doing this measurement, it's possible then to make a model and do some calculations that ultimately result in determining the leaf air index. So that's beyond the scope of this class, but it just tells you that we can do it both on the ground and by satellites and then compare that. So to summarize, the leaf area index is the primary metric that we have for characterizing vegetation and how it might interact with water. You'll see it's not the only one, but it's one of the important ones that we use. Besides the vegetative factors affecting interception, there are also the atmospheric factors, and they're listed here. Some of these are pretty obvious. I mean, you know, season, you know, a season drives vegetation cycles, but it also affects the you know, wind and rain intensity or currents of rain. And a lot of the other factors here are driven by season. If water falls as snow or rain, then that's going to have a big effect. Um, the state of a leaf due to temperature, um, also related to day versus night, can play a role as to whether the leaf is, furly, is completely unfurled or closed or the orientation of the leaf relative to the sun. Um, if, does, does the vegetation have time to dry out or not between events, which is another seasonal control. Um, the storm characteristics. Can a storm completely fill the ability of a canopy to hold water and, and get beyond that or not? Um, and then when dislodging or you know making water hit the canopy from different angles relative to the morphological structure of the tree. For example, you know, if you look at deciduous trees in the winter, there are no leaves present, so there's a very high throughfall percent, whereas during the summer there would be a lot less throughfall. Snow generally can be sticky or just um, pile up as a structure accumulating on a tree, so you could see here that much more water could be held in a tree as snow than it can be held as, as rainwater. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and continue on with case studies in the next podcast.